All right, so now we've gotten, and again, we could have probably gone on for like two more hours and easily found more issues and more things to deal with, but you guys hit on some of the primary ones that I wanted to make sure we could cover it, and you guys see, because you know what? We all see the same thing. We all see what's going on. We all see the issues with what's going on. We are, it's not like we can't see it. But not only that, but I think we can all agree that what we're seeing is the same thing we would be seeing if we went back 200 years or 500 years or 1,000 years. The body, the issues themselves, even though technology-wise we've come along and we've advanced in so many different ways as, you know, as a world has gone into the modern era, so to speak, but yet these issues have nothing to do with that, right? These are people issues, personality issues, uh, the cultural issues, the way we were raised issues. These are all kinds of flaws in the body that it goes all the way back even as Shira mentioned to Moses' time. Okay, so the question that I have is this then. Most of the ministries that have been out there over the years have, at least to some degree, I'm sure, thought about trying to do something to fix the problem. But what's missing? In other words, why has this problem not been fixed? So now we're going to talk about that from point of view. In other words, what, what is it that's allowed for people to just run around doing whatever's right in their own eyes? Or what's allowed for them to, you know, just go ahead and, you know... Uh, run around selfishly and self-centeredly or with their immaturity or the lack of kindness or what's a lot, what is the cause of all this that we're not addressing? What's missing that could possibly fix this problem? See, that's the key to this whole point to this whole teaching today is I want you to hopefully come to, I'm hoping you come to the same conclusion I have. I'm not going to steer you in that direction. But if I just tell you what I think the solution is, it has not even the remotest amount of power of you coming to the same conclusion yourself. So what is the missing thing? What is the, if the body would have what would start to fix these things? What is allowing these things to happen? Okay? So let's go and catch some of those hands that are up for that. Go ahead. Rachel, go ahead. I'm not sure if this actually answers your question, but one of the things that I think... But it has to. I want you to fix everything. <laughs> right now, it's, all that pressure's on you. <laughs> fix the problem. <laughs> Come on, Rachel, you can do it. I've been doing that for 40 years. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> That's a mother for you right there. I've got children. I've been doing that for 40 years. And it's not working very well, is it? No, I'm teasing you, don't we? <laughs> um, I think that we need to apply ourselves, which was kind of mentioned, but apply ourselves to the Word and... It says to that we will be washed in the word. Okay, let me I, interrupt you. So why do you think that's not being done? Ever, I, I, how many of you all know that point? Yeah. Do you think there's anybody in the body doesn't know that? Okay, so why aren't they doing it? Because I agree uh, with you, but they're not doing yeah, it. So why? I know. So why um, aren't they doing it? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is... The society that we've been raised in has taught us some very, very bad habits. Okay. And not only, not just the church. The church we, well, the, most of us came out of, that was just bad news. Okay. The world, the society, our culture has taught us a lot of bad habits. I agree. We tend toward being shallow, just trying to find a way to survive the next 10 minutes. Right. Okay. Survival we, versus thriving. Okay. And we don't see the long-range picture. We're not... Okay. It might be that we're not willing to invest the time and energy into diving in and applying what we read. Okay. It, I'm going to ask you the same question again, though. These are, sure. only, these are problems, not solutions. So why do you think that is? What's, what is missing that would fix that? I'm going to do that to all of you, so now you're all afraid <laughs> to grab the mic. Um. I just don't think we know how. Ah, okay. So what's the solution to that? <laughs> Not sure. Okay, good. Pass the mic. That's fine. Dawid, your turn. Fix your mother's problems. Uh, she's been trying to fix mine for a very long time, and she hasn't had very good clay to work with. So. Okay. Um, I, have, I haven't allowed the water to pierce me enough to be pliable enough. Okay, good. Uh, but... Uh, one of the things I see that could be a serious solution uh, is if people would actually submit to proper discipleship. Because people, okay. take, people take the old scripture that says, iron sharpens iron, 
And they always talk about that. Well, what is iron sharpening iron? Two swords truing each other. But how does a sword get to be a sword? It gets to be a sword because a lump of iron was taken and made steel and turned into a sword. Okay. That's what I view as being the discipleship process. And if you don't get through that, you're just a lump of iron hammering against another lump of iron or an, a sword. And so that's my perspective of what should be, and not to mention the fact that most people that aren't discipled wouldn't even remotely admit that they aren't discipled. That's true. Wait, wait, no, you're not off the hook. Okay, so why aren't people doing this? Sometimes they don't see a need, for example. Okay, don't see a need, okay. For example, you're, what you keep saying most of the time, and it's true, oh, the Ruach will teach me. Okay. Whereas people just don't see the need for structure and leadership. Okay, so they don't see a need for structure and leadership, so what's the solution to that? Ultimately imposed structure and leadership. Well, that's coming. Yeah. Okay. No, no, listen, he's, don't laugh. That's actually the right answer to the question. But what do we do in the meantime? Exhibit the fruit with each other. Because if we don't exhibit the fruit with each other and do our best to be patient with each other. How, uh, about, how about provide a platform to do it now while we're waiting for him to impose it? Exactly. Okay. As much as we can. As much as we can. All right. And then, wait, wait, what about those that know they need it, but they're still not doing it? What, why aren't they able to do it? Because you said some people don't even know they need it, but what about the ones that know they need it? What's causing their problem? Finding viable leadership okay, there we go. that would be sufficient to the need. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay, so we have a problem. The solution, the solution would be viable leadership available to do the discipling. Okay, good. All right, next person. Okay, Craig, you're, you're going to be after that. Go ahead, Craig, okay. and back. Okay, just one from the live stream. I, I don't see it, but maybe you would want to address it. Um, Omar Von Gimbel is saying that the solution would be to provide morals so that he can get circumcised to attend Passover. No, and Omar, Omar has a personal axe to grind with me. Okay, because so. he's just nonstop about I know. that. So. You, can, you can put him in timeout or if okay. he doesn't be. Omar, you got to stop this. You and I have been talking about this issue, and we'll continue it privately. Okay. Thank you. That was a You're huge welcome. relief. And then from myself, um, I would think that the solution has to do, I guess, with the first part of what we, are, what we all participated in, and that's putting a, a problem on the body and not on ourselves that it's so easy for me to see the problem with you right? and the problem with you and the problem with him. But ultimately, the, the same things, if I look hard enough, are found within myself. They're just very easily overlooked. Okay, so how do we fix that? Um, by discipleship, by submitting under somebody that we give authority to, hey, you know, you might not have seen this in yourself. Right. but okay. And that gets very difficult. It gets not difficult, but more difficult, like for us, you know, it's kind of like we kind of got, you know, started in a relationship online, mm -hmm. and then personally, it grows, but if either one of us are offended or something like that, and on a personal level, what I've witnessed being here is that it's, we can't be offended that we have to right. allow Abba the time to work, you know, with with me, with you, and, and with everybody here, right. and to understand that we're all been giving a huge gift, that the, the, those blinders being lifted is above and beyond anything that any one of us could have asked for, and any one of us that has that, we need to, to especially treat in a very special way that we're all precious jewels. Amen. I mean, and by the way, just as a side note, and look, this is going over the video, a lot of people at times will have personal issues with the teacher, with the leader, and that's okay. But don't bring them into the public forum and disturb everybody's shalom when you have a personal issue. That's not respectful. It's not respectful to the teacher. It's also not respectful to everybody else who's here to have a service to do that kind of thing. So uh, and that's to Omar. Omar, I'm very happy to continue to work out this issue that you have, but you're going to have to do it with me privately. This is not the forum for that. And that's part, of, again, the problem is having a, people understand the appropriate time and place for everything. There is an appropriate time 
and place for everything, but we just have a hard time knowing when that is and where that is sometimes. Okay, but by the way, so, so Craig, that was good. You got to, again, the need was discipleship to be, and being willing to have that disciple, discipler speak into your life to say, this is something you may not even see in yourself, but it's there. Okay, Trisha? For me, being here almost five years and learning wow. the, the goodness of Father, being submitted to a man of righteousness as yourself, and taking Deuteronomy 17, 9 through 11, seriously, with the fear of Yahweh, whenever I come to you with counsel, being willing to submit and obey the counsel, and to trust the Creator through that, whether it agrees with me or not, trusting Him and having the fear of Him to have that accountability to allow Him to change me and to grow me. That's, that's ultimately where, how we're going to to change. I mean, for me, that's where all my changes come from is through the fear of Yahweh of that scripture with my leader. Okay, now hold on. So let me just address this from a point. This is not about me. I want you to understand this. But there are those out there that are looking for, as we talked about, a leader that they could come or a disciple that they could work with, etc. Here's someone who says that they have one, okay? And so again, it's not about me being some great teacher or discipler, but she believes in Deuteronomy 17's verse that if she goes to a leader and submits to that authority and trusts in them because she believes she's vetted that person out, that the father will then bless the outcome. So what has been the fruit of that relationship? Um, <laughs> everything. Everything internal. I mean, I, I can't put it in words. This is too open of a phone. Okay, and, but can, and the credit goes to who? Does the credit go to me or to him? It goes definitely to the father. Okay, but because you're willing opinions. to be obedient and follow the counsel, he blessed the things. Absolutely. See, so it's, I don't want you to think that somehow this is about the leader. It's about the structure that yes. Abba put in place. Absolutely. Okay, I mean, okay, thank you. Okay, because again, there's a problem out there. Actually, there's a whole bunch of problems, but really the problem is really one problem that allows all these other problems to happen. Okay, Nate. Um, one of the things that I can recall is that when I joined the military, I gave up my self-sovereignty to come under leadership that I didn't even know. All I knew was about the military and hopefully was trying to find some kind of discipline within my life in order to be more productive as I grew as an adult, hoping to find that there. Now, mind you that not every military person is a godly person, just saying. Um, but when, if we can overcome our own self-sovereignty, vet out our leaders, find an anointed appointed, after we've done our studies and we've, we're looking for an anointed appointed, and we can learn to give up our self-sovereignty, not in a sense to where we're just blindly following, but in a sense that was like, okay, I know that Abba has chosen you to lead in this aspect. I'm willing to go through what it takes in order to become a disciple, but not only just a disciple to become a disciple, but somebody who can eventually grow into a leadership and whatever that is, and trusting that the leadership that is over me would be willing to or be able to look at me and say, this is where you're going to fit. This is where you're going to mm -hmm. be able to work. This is where you're going to benefit the body overall. And... Um, uh, I think it's in Timothy that talks about being a good soldier and Messiah. And if we could learn to give up our identity from wherever we went to and submit to, so submit to, to authority, um, I think that would be a big, uh, a big blooming of the body. But also to the leaders who are out there that don't, for some reason or another, say that there's no leadership involved or whatever, but they're on YouTube or whatever teaching and people are coming to them and talking to them and receiving counsel. Their leadership, they got to realize where they are at, submit to that. Maybe Abba is calling them to be leadership. But, be, but also finding the one who's anointed, appointed, that has already come up with the vision that we need to come together as leadership. And we need to figure out what it is that we need to do in order to move forward and be an example to the rest of the world so that we can be the bride of Messiah when he decides to return. Okay, hold on. Don't, don't talk, drop the mic. Okay, so I just want you to, okay, so what I'm hearing from Nate, again, you know, is that if we had that availability of that, avail of that leadership and that if we can come into line with that and get past, because this is the same thing that Abba asked us to do with him. And he works through human beings for us to do the same thing through human beings that he wants to do with him. Can you submit to that authority? But the reason we submit to him is because we know who he is and where he's taking us. 
And so can we do the same thing? That's the vetting process, right? But I do want Nate to take at least two minutes just to explain that this is not a man who was all that excited about leadership when I met him, okay? And so I want you to know that some of you may be listening going, oh, well, he probably was always good with leadership and everything. Oh, no, no. First words he said to me when I said to him anything, I don't know, in the first sentences we said, he said, just so you know, we're not interested in any kind of leadership. I mean, that was like in the first two minutes of conversation, Okay, so if you could just, I want you to speak to the people that are where you were, because they, they, they may think, oh, these people don't know what it's like to be where I am. I was abused, I was this and that, and I can't trust leaders. You can speak to them. Give them two minutes of. So just so we're clear, you're not the first person that I went to and blatantly got in their face and said, we're not, if you're here to sell what we've been receiving for the past however many years where we were in Christianity, we're not here to buy. Um, and as time went on, we got even more and more zealous against leadership and against authority. And we even tried doing it with just, oh, well, I'll just be buddies and we'll talk and we'll, you know, and we'll, there's no leader here. And, and it, we tried and tried and tried. Eventually, the group that we were in, one, buddy, one person rose up and became a leader and things were kind of looking like they were going good. But the more they tried to step up and be a leader, it, the more... To me, it just rubbed me in the wrong way. Something wasn't right there. But in my opinion, they might have been well knowledged, but there was no anointing and no appointing there. Maybe there was some anointing, but I don't think he was appointing. He was self-appointed. So when we came down to uh, Sukkot, we let Rabbi know we're not interested in, in coming under anybody. But uh, one of the brothers that was there said, bro, you can't, you can't have any kind of function without some kind of authority. And he took me to Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 1, where it talks about Moshe having leadership that was under him that had the, and so on and so forth. And then I was like, oh, man, it's right there in the Torah. <laughs> so so I got I to gotta take a second look at this. And um, it, you can't move forward. I'm thinking about the military, think about it for a second. You get a bunch of civilians that come off the street and you tell them, okay, today we're going to learn grenade launchers or something without any kind of leadership or authority. What kind of a mess is that going to be? It's going to be a total... Now think about that in a spiritual sense when it comes to Yahweh trying to establish his kingdom on this earth and says, okay, all you kids, all you babies, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit authority. I'm going to let you loose. Right. Without any kind of instruction or any kind of leadership. That would just be, a, well, we see the mess. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Doesn't the Ruach just teach them? <laughs> the Ruach is there to acknowledge when we hear the truth and support us and say, that's the truth. That, listen to what that's being said. Even Yeshua right. said, the Pharisees, they sit in Moshe's seat, do everything that they say, but don't do as they do. So we have to listen to what the Ruach is telling us. And for our family, the blessing of actually going, we're here and my wife will tell you, and she, this is nothing new. My wife will tell you when she met Rabbi after we sat down and we talked, and I was flabbergasted because she told Rabbi, not, not what she said to Rabbi, but that she actually took and listened to what he had to say and applied it, and it was a real blessing. And, and she told Rabbi, I don't like you, but I'm hearing what you're saying. And we were both very adamantly against leadership. And since that time, we've been taking time to pray and say, okay, Abba, I don't know if I can necessarily trust this guy, but for some reason or another, he's anointed. And the blessings that are coming through our household, a lot of you don't know all the background of where we were at when we first came here. I won't get into that now, but, but the blessings have have just been immense in our household just because we've submitted to authority. And I'm getting around other brothers and sisters who also have that military background who understand that submitting to authority. And what if, if we're unified and we're working together, that blessing that Abba promises, I, I'm positive. I get excited <laughs> because it could be so awesome. And if we could put ourselves aside... And give up our sovereignty, not to him, but to Yahweh. And trust that Yahweh is going to work in him when he's not stepping in the way that he needs to go, that Yahweh is going to deal with him. And that's where I'm at. I'm like, Abba, I got, 
I've been there. I've, I've done that. It's not working. I need leadership. I need Amen. authority. And um, Amen. I want to do right by him. So for our family, uh, we, 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 I was wrong. I was wrong in, I was wrong in uh, speaking against authority, um, even bad leadership. And I repent of that, and I've been repenting of that. But now I'm done with the repentance, and I want to move forward. Amen. I want to move forward. Amen. Let me just let me just put, and then we, we don't have a lot of time for too many more. We'll take a few more if we can. But let me just kind of put this into a perspective. Okay, I did nothing initially to impose this idea on Nate and his family. It was other brothers and sisters who had already worked with me and allowed me to work with them that basically insisted that they have a conversation with me. So just so you know, I, this is not because I kept pushing them or pu- trying to convince them. Or, no, they had to, because I said, fine, you don't want authority, fine, don't have authority. <laughs> I mean, I can't impose that. But it was others that went to him. And so it's a testimony of saying, we have tasted of this fruit, and it is good fruit. In other words, it's not just the counsel I gave fixes all their problems. A lot of their problems fixed themselves because they started to come into a different mindset, structure, and he started blessing them because of that structure. Okay? And that's the important thing to understand. And by the way, one of the things I did say to them, I said, look, what, what, what would it cost you just to give me six months or a year? I say, when they showed up at Passover, it was six months. And they came to me and said, look, because they, by the way, they tested me. They called me on every situation they could call me on to see how I'd handle it. You know, and sometimes it was the wife, sometimes it was the husband, sometimes it was the kids. <laughs> but there was people calling, like, let's put this guy to this, through the paces and see what he does. That's what you need to do, though. That's part of the process. Okay, so I'm going to want to wrap this up here in a minute or two. So let's just take one or two more people because I want to try, try and tie that together. Okay, so you got some hands back there. We'll go with Randy here and then we'll come back to the back. Go ahead, Randy. Um, Shira mentioned um, that we're waiting for one like Moses. I believe that's true. I believe that Yah has already chosen, you know, who, the, who this person is like Moses. And, uh, you know, the, so the leadership goes all the way up. I'm, I'm looking at that all these uh, Messianic congregations all across the country are, um, I guess you could compare it to, uh, you know, the different leaders are like the, the you know, 70 elders of Israel maybe. And of course, uh, and and you would be like one of the one of the elders of Israel in that in that respect of a modern day, uh, you know, where it goes on up up the line like that. <clears throat> you see what I mean? Like like Moses. Well, I understand what you're trying to say. I don't know that that model matches so well because we got a lot of people that ended up in these kind of leadership positions yeah. because they got there on their own. What was the anointing that was on Moses was given to those seventy, and, and Moses had picked those seventy out. These people out there have some of them are selecting themselves. Some of them, they have, we have no connection to each other. It's not quite the model, but Moses, I understand what you're trying to say. When Moses went back to Egypt. He, you know, he went straight to the elders of Israel, and uh, and then you know he called them all together, and that's that's what I'm seeing. Well, I understand. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But they all work together. They all knew each other. The leadership out here in the Messianic body is not doing any of that, actually. They're hardly even talking to each other. So we have a long way to go if that's actually going to be the model that we're going to end up with. I'd like to, I would like to think of it that way. I'd like to see it be that way. And I'd like to see us, as a matter of fact, I would like to try to have the financial wherewithal that we could host the conference of just the leadership to come in and talk to each other and no guests, no, no reg- and just the leadership to sit down. But we'd have to have the finances because, uh, uh, sadly, I don't think most of them would come if I didn't pay for their ticket and put them in a room. Okay? So we'd have to be able to afford to pay for tickets and rooms for all these guys just to get them to show up, which is sad. But I think that would have to happen. Okay? So that, that's been a vision, by the way, that I've had since 2009 or 10. And I actually spoke to leaders about having a meeting where just the leadership could sit down and try to talk about. That's where the MTOI model by the motto, motto came from, M-O-T-T-O, which is working together to serve the body more effectively. I wanted to have a meeting that would discuss that. And every leader I spoke to gave lip service and said, hey, that's a great idea. And maybe they really believe it's a great idea, but I, don't th- I, I didn't have anybody saying, when can we do it? I'm ready to come. And so we'll have to see how that plays out. So one or two more people, then I want to wrap this up. Okay, Zarek? Remember, we're looking for the solutions here. Um, I guess one of the solutions is uh, kind of go back with the iron, sharpen iron. Um, me and Zarek got into this show. It's called Forged in Fire. And you really learn that 
part of that initial process of making the sword is you take the lump of iron and it's the fire, it's the hammer, it's the anvil, it's those other two chunks of iron, you gotta beat it out. And it doesn't necessarily have to be just a raw chunk. You could have had something that got started in Christianity in a walk. There's a lot of good there. It's a starting function of something. But it didn't have what it took to finish it. Well, it's still got to go back in the fire, get put back on that big heavy handle, and smacked with that heavy hammer to finish forming it into the right shape before you can put the edge on. Okay, so the next time you guys buy me a gift, I'm looking for a hammer... Um, and, an, and an anvil. I, I actually already working on making you one of those. There you go. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but just that, it's like, go back to that, it's like, you know, I think a lot of the problem is people are scared of the initial part of that f- forging process. You got to get the fire. You got to get the hammer. Otherwise, you're just there. You're, you're not going to do anything. And again, so what's the reason why this is not happening and people aren't doing it is because they're not trusting the person to do it. In other words, you have to trust the person to allow them to come in there and, and take that hammer to you a little bit, okay? Uh, David, you'll be, you're the last one, so make it good. Great. All right, so yeah, if you're going to hate me after this. Um, I believe a way to address it, a lot of people, they come into the realization that Torah is relevant. Um, they seek to implement it, you know, it, it, put it into use in their lives. Right. Um, they recognize the need to seek out leadership or organizational support, they find MTOI, they recognize, you know, the authority that's been um, established there and everything. But collectively as Westerners, Americans, individuals as a whole, we're marketed to so much, we can't conceive of our identity outside of what somebody tells us it is. That's why cars won't sell unless they, they define who this car is for. And then you can envision yourself in that car because you know, I like that particular you know, vision of myself. And so marketing has a lot to do with it because they, they don't have the ability to understand <clears throat> who they are in the body as an individual. And I think what they're seeking is what we had in the military was the TTPs, the tactics, techniques and procedures for the daily application of it that defines basically who I am in the body, where I stand as a husband, as a, as a, a disciple, as a father. Um, how, does, how does my look, life look like as a part of a community that is connected to leadership and functioning as a part of a, a, of a larger group. Um, so they're basically, you know, they, they, they watch the teachings online and they understand it, but then there's that, that threshold they got across to implementing it and they're looking for more of a substantive, you know, means to, to actually take hold of it and apply it, much like a curriculum. So that would be the answer is a uh, uh, interactive or a uh, uh, some type of curriculum that can be published and dir- directed towards everybody that they can take and then see, oh, this is what Monday looks like, this is what Tuesday looks like, this is how a preparation day looks like. Something that really codifies and clarifies a lot of those things that aren't exactly um, clear in scripture. They're pretty, you know. Okay. Uh, like a, like a CC 101 class? That's right, yeah. You know, yeah. MTUI 101. I ought, to, so, I ought to consider doing one of those then. <laughs> no, that's really good. No, I appreciate what you're saying, David. Look, here's, here's the thing. Okay, let me kind of try to wrap some of this stuff up. I, I, I think you guys, first of all, did a fabulous job. I really appreciate that, okay? Now, I know, I know that you don't represent everybody in the body, but you guys are a good sort of wide spectrum. We got 300 plus computers online, plus all you guys here, you know? So we do have at least some sort of a... a a market sample, so to speak, of what the body's about. And, and so I think that, you know, we could even call it like a microcosm of the body, but I want to use that word microcosm to say, look, you know, the, the, what the father is doing, the family unit is a microcosm of that too, isn't it? Like you have a father and a son, and he wants to have the children of Israel be the children of the living Elohim, the sort of family idea. Okay, so what generally, when you look at a family, and that family is a complete disaster and mess, what is usually missing from the family? Leadership, structure, parenting, you know, which in, the, in the context of structure. Children tend to behave badly, lash out, etc., when there's no structure, or when there's bad structure, or overly loose structure, or overly, or overly restrictive structure. Just, it can go in all kinds of directions. It doesn't have good structure, then you have problems. 
We also have problems also in families. Remember, this is the microcosm. And this addresses something David mentioned towards the end here, with people maybe not understanding their role. Okay, there, everybody has their role in all of this. And, you know, and uh, Richard did mention about everybody having gifts. I want to be careful with that. Everybody has gifts. Not all of those gifts have to do with the structure. Okay? The problem is everybody that I run into the body thinks their gift is, has to do with the structure. You may have a wonderful gift. Let's, let's look at Zerubbabel. He had no structural gifting whatsoever, but he could build a tabernacle okay. Okay? I mean, he had anointings to make the things out of, you know, he knew what he was doing. So every one of you has a gift the body can benefit from. But that, see, what happens is a lot of people are trying to figure out, where do I fit into the structure? Well, the structure is what keeps us safe and helps keep us moving forward and all of those kind of things. And not everybody needs to be a part of that. And so the thing is that we have a lot of people all trying to figure out how they could be a part of that because they want to have a voice and influence on how that looks and how it functions. And that's where we get into trouble. Because then I have people contacting me all the time thinking that somehow they have an anointing and gifting to be part of structure, leadership, teaching, whatever it is. And that's a whole different thing. Not everybody has those. Most of you don't have that. But you have talents and gifts that I will never have that are more beneficial than anything I have when it's applied to the right person in the time they need what you have. Because when somebody needs what you have and I don't have that, then coming to me isn't going to help them at all. Because I don't have that, whatever that is. Okay? And so we have to just be careful with that. I agree with Richard a million percent. Everybody has a gift. Everybody has a talent. Everybody has a part in this. It just doesn't mean that that part has to do with the structure of it. And I think part of the reason the body is so messed up is because we have too many people thinking they need to be a part of the structure. And that gets back to too many chiefs and not enough Indians sort of thing. That, that old phrase that, you know, when Zarek brought that up. That is, that is part of the problem. Okay? And so this gets into the Korach part. Well, I have a gift and an anointing, but I don't like it. I want that other one. I want one to do what he's doing or what she's doing. Well, but he didn't give you that gift. He gave you the one you have. Now, maybe you don't know what that gift is, and then you can come to some of the people in the structure, or even just people who you're close with who could say, what is, what is my gift? What do you know? You know me. What, what do you see me having a gifting and anointing in? Because everybody has that. I, can't, I couldn't agree with Richard Moore. Everybody has that. But what causes some of the problem in the body is when you think, well, I'm going to choose what I think my gift is, and I want it to be the one I want, not the one I have. And that doesn't work. And then those people actually go in those positions and the body doesn't function really well because they really don't have the talents and the gifts for that position. So uh, what I'm hearing from everyone, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, if I, you know, if I jumped the wrong gun here, but when I'm listening to the problems with, uh, the, and I'm not even going to read them all through, but all of these things, people easily offended and selfishness and uh, immaturity and uh, focusing on learning without actually applying it. What is allowing all of these things to happen? The conflicts, the strifes, the arguments on the details and all the other things that are, all the divisive things that are happening, all the lack of kindness that some people brought up, the kindness, the love, the love that's not being felt. What is allowing all of this stuff to happen? I believe you came to the conclusion, you didn't all say it the same way, a lack of proper structure to function in. The body is so afraid of structure. I'm not claiming ours is the structure. All I'm hoping is that it's at least a model of what it could look like. Hey, if you don't want to be a part of this structure, then go find one. I think you need to find one like this. Okay? Now, somebody might say, okay, like Richard said, well, you know, I see that, you know, maybe, and I really appreciate this part. He said that there's a trust issue between the people and the leadership, and the leadership, and he gave both sides. Most times they don't give both sides. So I appreciate that he gave both sides. Because some people say, well, how come we don't have more structure, people in those positions to help? You know, why does it seem like mostly just one guy at the top? Well, because it's really hard to find people you can trust to be the guys next in line. Look at the problems even Moses had with that. Okay? And so there's a trust issue. I remember we had some people in the congregation a long, long time ago. And the lady had said to me, right when we first started this congregation, I said, well, what are you going to put in, in place, you know, church government? And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, she said, like, elders and, you know, like, I don't know what she meant. But I said, well, you know, you know maybe a board and all these kind of things. I said, well, okay. First of all, we've only had the congregation now for a month. 
And second of all, this wasn't birthed out of like a community I'd been living in for my whole life. I didn't know hardly anybody in the group. I said, so how can you expect me to appoint anybody into any position when I don't even know you yet? So four months later, not even, three months later, I'm getting yelled at that I don't listen. I said, what do you mean I don't listen? Well, I told you two months ago, three months ago, that you needed to put structure in. I said, actually, I don't remember you telling me anything. I remember you asking me when I was going to do it. But see, that's the other problem, is that people take their suggestions as instruction. And when you don't do what they instructed, they get all mad and thinking that you don't... Then I was accused of hating women because it was a woman who told me, oh, you just hate women. Why? Because I didn't do that immediately, what you said? I mean, I can point you to women like Trisha and many others who will tell you that that couldn't be further than the truth. Okay? The love and respect that I have for women. But the thing is, it's how people perceive things, right? And so I said again, after three months later, I said... I still don't know people well enough. I mean, it's only been five months. And plus, here you are with all this grief, and they were actually quitting the congregation when all this was going on. I asked what was going on, and they said, well, because you didn't do this and do that. I said, and here's even proof of my patience being the right way to go. I was thinking of you and your husband as potential deacons. Well, clearly, that wasn't a good decision since you're quitting and leaving. So good that I waited, right? And so the body has to understand. Sometimes they'll look over and go, well, it seems like it's all just one guy at the top. Well, sometimes it's because the one guy at the top really is an egomaniac. And sometimes it's because the guy at the top just has a real hard time finding anybody to put second, third, and fourth to build that structure because once they start, that person ends up going south on them. And I've had that happen many times. And some of you that have been a part of this congregation have seen it happen. Okay? So you know how bad that can be. And so, and that's not to say that I just made bad choices. That people looked all good and, you know, initially, and then who knows what happens and things go south. It's a very challenging thing. But the reason that we are struggling as a body is because, for whatever reason, up to this point, Abba has not put the anointed appointed in there and helped them work together to build the body into an organized structure. Well, you know, we had enough structure in the church, and look at where that God is, blah, blah, blah. The system wasn't wrong, the information they had was incomplete or in error, okay? The system was not wrong. The structure of having a body. As a matter of fact, some of you had a much better understanding of what structure looked like when you were in your churches and things did work better and life made sense and you knew where you belonged and knew everything that how it functioned. And by the way, you treated everybody probably with a lot more respect than you do now. It's amazing how people come out of that structure and they act in a way they never would have acted in church. And you know I'm telling the truth there. I mean, the behavior that people do now, you would never have done that in your churches towards the leadership. There's just no way. And you know that's true. So why are you doing it now? Well, I'm angry. Okay, I know you're angry. And you're frustrated and you're disappointed. So am I with all of that. You know why? Because I have to counsel everybody through all that mess. It's a lot of hours. It's not easy. But I want to see, now you guys can go out there and be the spokesperson. Just like that person that sat down with Nate and his family and his wife and said, oh, you just give this guy a chance. And I'm not saying just that about me. If, you, if you're out there watching this and you have good leadership where you are and you have good anointed appointments, I mean, I have no idea how many anointed appointments there really are out there. I'm not claiming I'm the only one. I'm not claiming I'm even one. That's up for you to figure out. But the thing is, if you know of it, you need to be the person that tells other, be that evangelist to share that with other people who you see needing it to say, you really need to give this a chance. It makes a difference. Tell your story about all of the blessings and all the fruit and all the mess that's been cleaned up because you found that. Because that is going to work a lot more powerfully and effectively than me up here saying, well, the leadership will fix all your problems. Okay, that's it. We're done. Because leadership is some of the problems. So I don't want to minimize that. We've got distrust of leadership. We've got abusive leadership. We've got transparency issues. We've got unqualified leaders, unqualified teams. We've got a mess. And Abba's allowed that mess, and that's why we've not been able to unify in the dispersion because of that mess. You think the, uh, the Messianic Hebrew roots, whatever we are, Torah-observant body, is any less splintered than the denominational Christian church? You know Why? Where did everybody all come from? <laughs> they all came out of that into this. They brought it all with them. It's a mindset. It's a, it's a cultural thing. It's, it's, we learn this stuff. See, I appreciate what Nate, not Nate, what Craig was saying, 
But Craig, it's never going to happen in the way you, you wanted it to happen when you said, wouldn't it be beautiful with the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, whatever. That's never going to be what you're envisioning if it's just the children and the grandchildren, and et cetera, learning the same bad stupidity that we're doing now. Because they're learning what we're doing. They're watching us. They're imitating us. That's the generational cursing right there. The perpetuation of the bad behavior of this generation. Because after all, you know why we have so many bad marriages? Well, how many good marriages have we had to watch to see how good they look? How many of us came from bad marriage houses? Almost everybody, probably. Most people. I mean, if more than half of them end up in divorce, then obviously we're doing that pretty badly. So what's the odds that you had a great example in your house watching your parents? Now, I'm not saying nobody had that, but how many did? Not many. How many had a good example of what it was like to, you know, you go to work and you probably end up next to the guy at work who's already treating the boss with disrespect, and then you learn everybody else in the group is doing the same thing, so you start imitating them. We tend to follow with the crowd. Don't follow with the crowd. The crowd might actually be a bunch of lemmings headed for the cliff. Be careful where the crowd's going. You may want to ask the crowd, by the way, where are you guys going? As long as I'm following along here. Okay? And so this is, this, and by the way, there was a saying I heard a long time ago that actually might apply to this. You know, you could be on the right road, but if you're standing still, you could still get hit by a car. And see, some of you are on the right road, but you're not moving. Okay? And so I'm hoping that this part seven of this teaching will be something that when it gets out there, people will go through the process of looking at the body. You guys missed a bunch of things that these guys found, and you hit a bunch of things that they didn't find, so it's great. So together, we got such a huge picture. But it talked about people um, with knowledge overreach, with lack of accountability. Um, let's see. Some people thinking that now that we have some knowledge of the Torah that we've arrived. That's a big problem in the body. Well, I know something how I've arrived. We don't know what we don't know. See, that's one of the things that I talk about, the elementary school model of all of this is that, you know, when you go through elementary school and get to college, college is not like because you show up there because now you have all this information. Now you're showing up there to realize how much you don't know, but now you have tools to really learn something. Because now you can start applying it in much bigger ways. But it takes you a long time to realize you don't know what you don't know. How many of you, when you listen to a teacher, and by the way, all of you, all of you that believe that you only learn, listen to the rock, stop looking online for teachers, stop downloading podcasts. Why are you looking for any of that stuff? Go to a quiet place, let the rock teach you. See, you're all being dishonest with yourselves. I was going to say something else, but I won't. Okay? I'll keep it polite as I can. You're lying to yourself, though. You can't tell me you're taught by the Ruach, and then you go online searching for teachings all over the place. Why are you, why are you calling me for counsel, sending me emails, and all these other teachers the same thing, who you're sending and asking? Why are you asking all these questions if the Ruach is teaching you? I'm not picking on the Ruach, don't get me wrong. It has a role that's critical to all of this. And we taught that, hopefully quite extensively, on the teaching called Understanding the Ruach. But that's not the point. The point is, the attacks on structured leadership and structured teachers, I understand where they're coming from, because after all, we're overridden with bad ones. Okay? So I understand that. So what's the solution? Let's go and support the good ones and encourage people to get behind that so the good ones can then train up more good ones. And that Abba would lead anointed people that just need some molding and working with. That's called discipleship. Okay, Yeshua picked the ones that he knew would do the jobs he could have them to do, and then he trained them to do it. They started off with the gift, though. They started off with the talent. It's kind of like if I'm looking to put together a basketball team... I'm not just going to randomly pick people off the street or out of a room. I'm going to ask people to come and audition and show me whether or not they have any talent for it. Now, just because they're talented doesn't mean they're ready to play. How many of you have noticed that there's some teams out there with the most talented people and they never win? Well, they don't win the big ones. Why? Because just because they're talented, they still they lack leadership because they're too self-sovereign. Right? You get those guys that they won't take any coaching, they won't take any instruction, but you find the ones that when they finally get under a leader who they can listen to, then what happens? All of a sudden, if those egos get put down, the team starts working as a team and they get somewhere. Talent wasn't always it. Because we've seen some teams win that weren't the most talented teams. But they learned to act and work together. They had talent, though. They had the talent. 
But just because it's the overabundance doesn't mean that you, you can just go out there and say, well, I've got all this talent, so look at how great I am. Not if it's not worked with and harnessed and then pointed in the right direction. Does that make sense? And so this is where I think the body is. Can we agree then on this? So we need to now be, all of us, spokespeople for the idea from Scripture, by the way, because what happened with Moses, right? Moses, you need structure for these people. So he put structure in place. Deuteronomy 17 is very big. And by the way, this becomes a problem for some people because the people that will use this, especially from the Jewish community, I had a little battle recently with somebody over this. You know, Deuteronomy 17 says that when you have an issue that the leadership can make a decision on, then the leadership has authority to make the decision on it. That doesn't mean, by the way, that a leadership decision that was made 100 years ago can't be made differently by leadership today based on the cultural changes and other things, because that happens. All right? Because this was a discussion that was happening with somebody over whether or not you could put seat seat on your belt loops. Well, they have to go in the corners of your garment. So we don't wear cornered garments anymore. Well, you could wear a talit katan. I said, or you could put them on your belt loops. But that's not the corners. Well, the Bible talks about the four corners of the earth. Where are those corners? I don't care if you're a globe earth, flat earth, or anything else. Nobody thinks it's square. I'm just saying. I'm not disrespecting anybody. Nobody thinks it's square. At least I'm not seeing anybody promoting that one yet. So four corners is not necessarily a literal statement. So on my belt loops, which go around my body in four positions that cover the directions of my body, that matches. But I, as the leader, have authority, according to Deuteronomy 17, to make that decision. Because after all, Numbers 15 does not tell you exactly what they look like and how to attach them to your clothes. It doesn't. So without that, now we're back to Deuteronomy 17. Can we agree? But see, we can't get to Deuteronomy 17 unless you're in a structure where there's a leader who can make that kind of decision. Is that fair? So this is what's hurting the body. Again, the body has been allowed to go and behave this way, like we talked about basics. Who has the authority to decide what's a basic? Who has an authority to decide what's critical? Who has a, where is the authority to make people stop? Because people will say to me, well, how do we make all this work? It can't work unless you voluntarily submit to it. I've had people come up to me and say to me when they've seen some stuff going on out there, why can't anybody make that person stop? I'm talking about leaders and teachers out there that are doing crazy things that people are upset about. They'll contact me. I said, what do you mean make them stop? Nobody can make anybody do anything unless that person submits to that authority voluntarily. Think of it even with your children. Once your children get old enough and they're no longer voluntarily submitting to your authority, it's hard to make them do anything. Once they realize, they can say no and they can move out and they can do whatever they want. Authority only works if you submit to it voluntarily. So when you want to know why people are not behaving, it's because those people are not submitting to authority. So authority can't make them stop. That goes back to the point that somebody had brought up where it said, well, that authority is going to come and be imposed. I think you said that, right? That we'd said that. And why do you think it's going to be imposed? Because that's the only way ultimately some people are going to have it happen. There will be some that will do it voluntarily, though. Why can't that just be us? Do you really want the rod? He's bringing the rod. Okay, he's not bringing a bunch of smiley face stickers to hand out to everybody and put in your little notebook. There you go. Just come as you are, do what you want. Okay, I'll give you a little gold star, whatever. I heard you. He's bringing a rod of iron. And guess what? He's going to beat a few people with it. And it's not literal. He's not literally going to beat you with a rod of iron, but he's going to come with discipline, and that discipline will be imposed. Have you ever, as a child, had discipline imposed on you? Or even as an adult at your job or some other place where discipline was imposed on you? It was it fun? It works a lot better when you volunteer and you submit voluntarily. But don't do that unless you've made the effort to vet the person, vet the structure, vet the leadership. See, a lot of you were kind of hampered in this conversation because you're already in MTOI, 
You're in a structure that has been blessing you and working for the most part, I'm, I'm assuming. So that's why a lot of you have those very positive things to say. Well, obviously, this is what we need. But see, a lot of people who are going to be watching this are not here in this, in this kind of a structure, have no idea what you're experiencing because all they know is the bad experiences that they've already had. And so you have an opportunity to be the powerful voice if you happen to interact with some people and hear them and just say, but I can tell you my testimony. And share that testimony. Because that's what they need. Because without you telling them, but this is, because that's what worked with Nate and his family is that somebody else with a testimony said, you don't understand. I don't trust anybody but my husband and rabbi. Isn't that what she said to you? Okay. And she only trusts us because she vetted us first. She vetted him before she married him and she vetted me when she met me. But she was able to say that through her experience and through, her, and through the, the vetting experience, you know, she had the relationship. Remember what I said to somebody else about correcting, okay? I said that, I think, to, to Reno. You cannot correct somebody you don't have a relationship with. Why would, that, why would that person listen to a thing you had to say? I love it when people email me correcting me about all kinds of things they think I'm wrong about, and I don't even know them. Now, they think I know them because they watch all of my videos. That means they know me. I don't know them. Just because you watch me on the screen doesn't mean I know you. So why would I take anything from, I, if I don't know you? I mean, would you really receive correction from someone you don't know? But yet people are always trying to correct the leaders out there and they don't know them. Why? Why would you think that would make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. So when I say that not everybody has that role to correct, the first part of that role is you must have a relationship with that person. And that relationship is, must be one where there's an expectation that you have the right to do that. In other words, I have voluntarily with many of the other leaders, friends of mine, said to them, you have my authority. In other words, I've, I've given, submitted to you that I am open for you. If you see me doing anything you think is out there and wrong and whatever, just grab a hold of me and straighten me out. I'm ready. I, we do that with each other but only because we voluntarily offer that to each other, the accountability. See, then that person now has absolutely the position to correct. But if you were just a guest in this congregation and I heard you say something or saw you doing something, unless it was causing a problem in the group, I would have no authority to say a word to you. You're not, we have no relationship yet. Is that fair? So you have an obligation. It's on you, not the leader. Everyone's like, well, the leader doesn't make time for me. Leader. Well, did you make time for the leader? Now, don't do this at Sukkot after I just say this out loud because some of you are going to do this. Well, so I do it anyway. It doesn't matter. But I can tell you at Sukkot and Passovers how rarely anybody saves me a seat so that they can sit and talk to me. So I end up sitting with my, my best friend who always has a seat for me. Okay? Uncle Bob over here. I so said, he doesn't mind that nobody has saves me a seat because then I always end up sitting with him. But people generally don't save me a seat to get to know me, to sit with me. Hey, come over here. We don't know you that well. Come and sit with us. Come and get to know us. Why? I eat last, so it's not like I'm running around and you can't find me. I mean, I'm, I don't sit until everybody sits. I always get the food last. I mean, it's easy for someone to save me a seat. It's very rare, okay? And I'm not upset because nobody saves me a seat. By the time I eat, half the people have already finished and walked away and led. There's plenty of seats. But that's not the point. The point is, are you, are you even making an effort to get to know the leadership? Because trust me when I tell you, you're not knowing me just from what you see here. You're only knowing a certain amount. Now, I'm not phony. What you see from the mic is real. But that's not enough. You got to spend time away from that to say, well, what's the person really like? Sit down, have dinner, break bread, whatever it is. Let them get to know you, get to know them. How else will you really know? Now, some of you have been really good. Some of you that have moved here, you know why I know you moved here? Because not only have you listened to you, but you've spoken to me on the phone, and we've called, and we've talked, and we've, so you've gotten to know each other. So you know whether or not that person actually even cares about you. Because I promise you, there are some teachers. Now, I don't know, I'm not naming any names. I don't know anybody. Not, nobody's coming to my head as a name. But I know there are teachers out there that if you talk to them, they would never make a minute for you. They don't care. They just want to put the teachings out there, have you send checks in and whatever. They don't care. You know that. You've experienced that. So why would you want to be under that leadership? You want to find leadership that cares about you. How are you going to know if they care about you? Well, call them. <laughs> Go make an appointment. Spend some time. Come and visit. 
Whatever you need to do. And it's not just about me. This is what you do with any leadership wherever you are. Because I know this is going on YouTube and then everybody will get to see this. You could be in another country, but wherever you are. And pray that Abba, if there isn't, would bring somebody there or bring somebody to where they can be trained and then sent there. See, this is how the bigger organizations do it, right? They have denominational seminaries. They've got, the, like the Orthodox do with the yeshivas. They train people up, and then they send them out and make them available. Well, we should have that in the body, shouldn't we? But how are we going to do that without structure? Because you know what? The churches can do it because they have what? Money. Now, why do they have money? Not because they got wealthy people, but because they got millions of people. Well, we don't have millions of people. We're a small remnant. But if the small remnant actually supported the work that's being done, we could build these things. We can get a property where we could put a yeshiva on there and put temporary housing so that people like a, like a campus could come and stay for six months or a year and have classes and be trained. I got a few people I want to do that right now. But you know what? Buildings are not cheap. Land is not cheap. I mean, I am very blessed by the donations that you guys send in, and I appreciate that because it allows us to do the work we're doing, and I get to do this full-time so that I could be available 24-7. But we do not have the, the, the level of donations that can afford the things that... And I'm not asking you for money. I'm just letting you know, if this is what you want, you got to support it. If it's not what you want, it's okay. But just so you understand where the problem is, because some of you might be like, well, why aren't we doing this? I can tell you, simple. <laughs> we don't have the money for it. We have the heart for it, the drive for it, the desire for it. We're ready, willing, and able. We just don't have the money. So if you don't have the money and don't have any way to support it, that's great. Pray Abba will bring somebody who has it. Okay? Because I don't need a brand new Cadillac or Mercedes or whatever. I need a yeshiva. Because you need a yeshiva. All right? I'm almost needing a new van, though. This one's starting to really start to hemorrhage. And you know when they get to that age where little things start getting, and more and more things start happening? It's getting to that point almost. But that's not the point, all right? The point is, hopefully we can now take to heart what you guys came to. Hopefully you came to that same conclusion that I was, that I, this is what I've been trying to tell you for six other parts of this teaching. We know what the problem is. The only solution really is getting in line with the Father and the Son. You all hit that earlier. That's not an issue, but he wants us to do that through human people, through leadership that guides us in that process. That's always been the case. I mean, always. All the way back to Adam. I mean, always. Adam was supposed to train the next people all the way through. Okay? You see Noah and Shem doing this as they train up Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. I know something like, where does it say that in the Bible? Well, it's in the book of Yashar and other places, but it's there. It's the Melchizedekian in the right understanding. Okay, the Melchizedekian priesthood is the priesthood of discipleship. Okay, it's not something that stopped and started in different times. It always was running at the same time as the other priesthoods. There was no Levitical priesthood, so we had only the Melchizedekian. Then there was both. Moses essentially was the Melchizedekian. Aaron was the Levitical. Okay, because birth had nothing to do with the Melchizedekian. The fact that they were both Levites was irrelevant. Moses was really the Melchizedekian one, and Aaron was the Levitical one. And they ran together for a while, and then when it says with the Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, it says that Yeshua is now high priest of the Melchizedekian. And there you have it. And by the way, the book of Hebrews being written, knowing full well we're about to have no Levitical anymore because the temple was about to be destroyed. The book of Hebrews is written right around that time. When I say right around that time, I mean like literally probably during the siege. I mean, they knew their days were numbered, that it was over. Hopefully that makes some sense. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Avina Makeno, our Father, King, Father, we want to come before you and we want to just absolutely cry out to you for your mercy and your compassion to hear the great needs in the body. The body is, is, is really so wanting to get things right and so wanting to be transformed and conformed to your image and in the image of the Son, but yet the body also from generation to generation has just not learned how to do that. And so, Father, we suffer with conflicts and strifes and arguments and all kinds of issues that cause us to feel offended and bitter and fearful and, and we, with the immaturity that's there that, you know, we can't get... How are we going to grow up without structure and leadership? 
But Father, we have also, because of these experiences, such a great fear of leadership, which is probably why we don't submit to you the way we should, because after all, you are the ultimate of leadership. And if we have a problem with leadership in general, it's going to overflow and outflow into how we treat you. So Father, help us to find those anointed appointed. Help us to be willing to submit ourselves to the structure that you would put into place. And for those of us in leadership, give us the strength to not embarrass you to do the role that we've been talking about here because you know what? There's nothing more hypocritical than saying all this stuff and then not walking it. (coughs) So Father, please help us in leadership to not embarrass you, but not to bring you shame, but to only bring you glory and honor, to make you proud as we stand in that role of servant in serving the body and so that all we're doing is pointing everybody to you. That it's never about us that it's always about you. And that if we have any frustration or anger or whatever about people not listening, that it's not because we're mad at them not listening to us, but because we understand that in not listening to us, they're only going to be hurting themselves and hurting their relationship with you. That it can't be about us in the teacher role, in the leader role. So Father, help if there are those out there that you would lead to work together. The MTOI vision that I believe you gave us was that we'd find the leaders that were out there willing to work together to serve your body in a more effective way. And if there are young, by young meaning new to leadership and teaching or new to teaching this style of teaching that you would have led, I mean, they could be young, meaning they could be in their 50s or 60s or 70s. It doesn't have anything to do with age. But those that, are, that you would like to have trained to be sent to those that can do the training so that we can raise up more structure to put in place to make it so that people can thrive Because one of the points that was brought out about surviving versus thriving, and most of us are just barely making it. But we should be thriving. But I think we can't thrive without being inside of the proper structure. See, the land was supposed to be structured. We understand that, that being in the land of Israel as a nation was the structure that brought all of the thriving. And now we're structureless. And we suffer. And we have lack. And it'll have all the cursings part of the chapter, Deuteronomy 28. So, Father, please, we just, we really just throw ourselves at the, at the floor, at the, just at the, at the feet of the mercy seat, just asking that you would hear our prayer and provide the, the needs of the body, which is leadership and structure, and help the body to see that need correctly. And not just any leadership and not just any structure, but your structure and true anointed, appointed leadership. And help us to understand our role in finding those people and allowing the Ruach to lead us to those people. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you, and we ask all these things from the deepest parts of our hearts in the name of our, not only our, our high priest and our king, but the one we're trying to change into, into his image, so that we could be that child of yours that is well-pleasing in your sight, so that we could be just like our older brother, our Savior and King, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen.